Hello class, welcome to the introduction to our next film for the semester. Uh, before we briefly provide some context for that, I'd like to present and talk about the role cinematography plays in film. Uh, once again, both of these uh, discussions that we have here with this video lecture, uh, we'll consider them very brief, but we'll provide you a good way to introduce yourself and become familiar with the concepts. So in this lecture, we will discuss some basic elements of cinematography, provide some examples, and introduce the context to the film Moonlight by Barry Jenkins. Cinematography, as described by Barsom, is the process of capturing moving images on film or a digital storage device. The word comes to us from three Greek roots, kinesis, meaning movement, photo, meaning light, and graphia, meaning writing. The word was coined only after motion pictures themselves were invented. So one of the things that you can think of is that the notion of cinematography was born as the medium that used it was born. Also cinematography has changed throughout the years, mainly in terms of the way technology of film has changed as well. Bill Butler, uh, this is a quote from Bill Butler, who was the director of photography sort of the person who is centrally in charge of recording and helping the director define the look of a film, uh, worked on Jaws, one of the previous films we watched in the semester, has this to say. One of the things that is important is your ability to understand the truth in the film you're making. Where should you put the camera? How should your camera look at the story? If you do it wrong, then you interrupt the truth you're trying to get to. Butler's quote tells us why cinematography is important. Cinematography is one of the key elements of film that helps over establish the overall look and mood of a visual narrative. When we talk about mood, we are essentially talking about the tone of a film, right? That is the feeling you get when watching it. You can think of this uh, really in relation to various genres. The emotions of horror movies are different from the emotions of romantic comedies. Every uh, part of the film that appears on screen, what we have called the mise-en-scene, that's, you know, costuming, lighting, designing, acting, sets, everything that is presented to you to view on the screen, one of the cinematographer's job is to take the mise-en-scene and present it as a coherence, provide a unifying visual structure so that all the disparts that go into a film uh, that are shown in front of the camera acting to stage design have a certain sort of unity and as Bill Burr said present it and present the story in a true and believable manner. So who is the cinematographer? Cinematographers work hand in glove with the director. Oftentimes the cinematographer is there to help the director uh, present their vision of what the scene and film should look like and capture it on film. The cinematographer's responsibility for each shot and setup, as well as for each take, fall into four broad categories. The properties of the shot, as in how the camera, film stock, lighting, lenses, which, what part of the technology will be used. The framing of the shot, how close actors or objects will be to the camera, how, how far the depth of field, how far back will be visible and in focus, camera angles, height, scale, camera movement, the speed and length of a shot, if you're helping to think of things going into slow motion or sped up, and will often help with any special effects, especially notions of practical effects, things that are done in front of the camera right there, how makeup will look on an actor, things of that nature, how explosions, if you're doing a Michael Bay film, will look on film. So the cinematographer works very closely with the director. So some of the things that uh, a DP, a director of photography might do on a film is help choose the visual style for the film, help the director take what is in their head and, and make it a more concrete, unified vision, help a camera setup for each shot, let know which camera setup would, would work to fulfill that vision, explores the potential of locations uh, to see if how they would be seen on film if they're possible, attend rehearsals, and work to elevate the director's vision 
uh, to make the director's vision come to life on screen in the best way possible. So one of the things that we've talked about and one of the things I'd like you to focus on is the notion of lighting. The director of photography is often work with the rest of the crew, uh, lighting designers and people working on the set, to establish the lighting of a scene or film. Ideally, as we've talked about, lighting shapes the way a movie looks and helps to tell the story. A key component of composition, lighting creates our sense of cinematic space by illuminating people and things. If you remember way back to the beginning of the semester, we talked about how no film works without light going into the camera. So as we talk about light, one of the things we should look at is what do we talk about the quality of light. Quality of light refers to whether light is hard or soft. You probably can have your own experience of this in real life. For example, if you've ever tried to take a picture of yourself, uh, maybe at school or at a doctor's office or in an office where you work with that hard fluorescent lighting and you look terrible and it looks like you are 100 years old, as opposed to the soft lighting of a, of a nice bulb you've chose at home that provides a nice glow, you know, you see different types of lighting in terms of hard and soft. On film, we can generally, although not always, associate hard lighting with high contrast, featuring deep shadows and bright figures. This is also known as low key lighting, referring to the keying in and balancing of the light in the background. With serious or tragic stories, soft, even lighting, what is called high key lighting, uh, is found, where you see uh, more of the picture, more of it's balanced, and you don't have these strong contrasts of dark and light. So here are some examples of high key lighting. Right? You see the dark uh, black backgrounds, figures in bright, bright contrast. Uh, you see this a lot with horror movies. Um, as you remember in Metropolis, uh, mainly due to technological technological reasons, but also in terms of uh, thematic reasons, Rotwang here was shown in a lot of high key lighting because he's of course an evil and psychotic figure in the film, so he's dangerous. And then here are some uh, soft light examples: uh, romantic comedies, romantic moments, and one of the more interesting uses of of this would be in many uh, Avengers movies in some of the battle scenes. My suggestion is that because these are superheroes, because these are movies that uh, Disney would like the whole family to see from 12 to 40, it's in a soft light figure. So you know that even though Iron Man and Captain America are fighting here, they're not really fighting. Nothing too bad. The next object we would like to look at is depth of field. Depth of field, uh, along with lighting for our purposes, are two of the major elements of cinematography I want you to focus on as you watch the film. Depth of field is the property of the lens that permits the cinematographer to decide what planes or areas of image will be in focus. Depth of field helps to create the emphasis. As you know from taking a picture yourself, when things are focused, they can be seen clearly and visibly. When things are out of focus, they are blurry. We have three types of lens that will help present a sort of focus, a depth of field, and then we'll look at one special one in a moment. First, let's look at short focal lens. It offers nearly a complete depth of field, rendering almost all objects in the frame visible. So this would be used to show everything in the most detail possible. So nothing would be quote unquote out of focus. Long focal lenses leaves the background and foreground uh, of the frame of objects dramatically out of focus, right? So this is when, if you want to focus on a central character, but have stuff in the background be blurry. Middle focus keeps all subjects in a normal sense of focus, where things uh, will have some a balance of things in focus and out of focus, but what we would expect to from our normal sense of vision. The last thing we'll take a look at is rack focus. Normally, cinematographers want to keep the main subject of each shot in sharp focus. You can always tell a sort of B-movie or bad movie if the main characters, the things that are the most important on the screen, are out of focus. However, a rack focus, uh, which is also known as a select focus or shift focus or pull focus, 
changes the point of focus from one subject to another. This technique guides our attention to a new clear focus point of interest while blurring the previous subject in the frame. Most recently, we have seen a rack focus in one of our first introductions to the character of Charlotte in Lost in Translation. If you remember, there's a point where she's sitting in the window looking out at the city of Tokyo and she's initially blurry. They rack focus in and all of a sudden, Charlotte comes into clear, perfect focus. Now, after our brief discussion of cinematography, one of the things that I would like to do is provide a brief survey of African-American cinema. Moonlight is one of the more notable and famous uh, uh, representations of African-American cinema in recent memory. But like anything, this didn't come out of nowhere. I also think it's important for us to understand a bit of the background of African-American cinema, as this is our first film by an African-American creator that we've looked at this semester. So, the early roots of African-American cinema, like many African-American art, is a response to what we might consider Caucasian-American art. One of the black, early black filmmakers was Oscar Michaud, whose movie Within Our Gates in 1920 was an impassioned response to D.W. Griffith's famous and racist epic, The Birth of a Nation. This kind of sparked an early trend of what we would call independent African-American cinema uh, that were over a thousand theaters that screened black audience films exclusively for black audience or on a preferential basis. This sort of separate and African-American chain of theaters and cinema lasted until the mid 1950s. After the 1950s, this system of independent African-American cinema ground to a halt and slowed down for a number of reasons. One, which is offered intriguingly, was integration, much like how Jackie Robinson signaled a sea change in the Negro Leagues for baseball, increasing integration in what we would call, quote unquote, mainstream Hollywood films of African-American actors caused a similar thing for African-American cinema. Here's a picture uh, of an and images from Within Our Gate. Probably the next era of African-American cinema we could look at would be what is briefly called the black exploitation, although that only occurred closer to the 1970s. Beginning in the 1960s, which were a time, as you know, of high civil rights movement, uh, the black arts movement was there to create a nationalist political consciousness. This was concentrated more on performances, literature, poetry, and music. However, film uh, became a part of this. One of the major representations of this was Melvin Van Peebles. Uh, you might know his son, uh, Mario Van Peebles, from lesser important movies, but still fun. Uh, his French New Wave inspired a story of a three-day pass, kicked off a sort of wave of 1960s uh, consciousness-inspired African-American cinema, which then built to what you may commonly know as black exploitation. Black exploitation is a problematic uh, and interesting uh, strain of African American cinema. Problematic due to its stereotypical characters, presentation of women, presentation of African American uh, men in general, but it has to be noted was one of the first popular movements of film where black characters were not sidekicks, subjects of violence, but were the heroes and subjects of the film themselves. On the left, you can see the stark contrast in the 1960s, a story of a three-day pass, and then later elements and representation of black exploitation. The next major one we could look at would be what was called in the 1980s, the quote unquote, black new wave. After black exploitation, films were deprioritized de uh, for moving going audiences until the 1980s, early 1990s, when filmmakers such as Spike Lee, followed by John Singleton and the Hughes brothers, emerged. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly an end date for this so-called black new wave. One could even draw a line all the way to Barry Jenkins in Moonlight as a part of it. But the number of sharp original works created by African-American directors did decline for a period in the mid-90s. 
Listed below are some popular films of this genre, some of which you might have seen yourself. So on the left, obviously, we have Do the Right Thing, uh, and it's sort of seen, and then another example, a lesser known example called The Sidewalk Stories. So it was into this brief, uh, all too brief discussion of African American history that Barry Jenkins' Moonlight uh, emerges. Here's a quote from Ashley Clark, whose article I used in this presentation quite a lot that provides way more detail um, and is a much greater and better survey than I could ever hope to offer. As cinema has moved more concretely to the digital realm, the medium has become democratized and new spaces for independent cinematic storytelling have opened up. In this newly democratized climate, there is once again a palpable buzz around black American independent cinema. We should always be wary of constructing narratives. They can distort thematic diversity, silo filmmakers, and create unhelpful expectations. The future looks bright. So we could kind of think of uh, directors like Barry Jenkins, like Ryan Coogler, like Anna DuVernay, and others as part of a new, new wave, or the next wave, maybe. One of the things that you will do when you look at the research materials on Moonlight provided on Blackboard, we'll see some context for how Barry Jenkins' voice uh, among African-American directors is a novel and original one that both connects to this long history of African-American cinema, as well as innovates and presents a new voice of his own. 